Good morning and thank you very much for joining us. I hope you had a great weekend. I am Yuri Fulani. Well, on Saturday, um, ECOWAS announced that it was lifting sanctions on Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso. Um, it did say that for the purpose of clarification, uh, certain targeted sanctions remain in place without giving details about um, what that really means. Perhaps it is known to um, the pros in the, the, the diplomatic community, but um, uh, essentially it has been lifted. Air blockades, barriers to borders, trade, and all of that kind of a thing. Well, our guest this morning is Dr. Kayode Esola. He's a political scientist and research associate uh, professor at the Institute of African and Diaspora Studies. Fine morning to you, Kayode. Good morning, Yuri. Yeah. Good morning, Nigerians. Indeed. Um, well, uh, did the news catch you by surprise? Not at all. You recall that um, in our last conversation about this subject, I insinuated that ECOWAS would need to go to the drawing table and do that which it had just done on Saturday. Okay. The facts are clear. So when the, when the announcement came on Saturday, I was not in any way surprised. I was like, this is expected. Um, okay. Um, uh, we, we'll, we'll come to look at aspects of this, but um, I, I have heard some commentators um, uh, sort of uh, negotiate the question as to whether or not ECOWAS uh, had been poked in the nose uh, with this, so to speak. I will not put it that way. But uh, I will say that when you have a body like ECOWAS, uh, you have an institution that needs to rely heavily, if not 95%, on discussions, interactions, conversations, and diplomacy to resolve crisis, not force, not coercion, not instrumentalities of the military. And so uh, it is not because it is held in the jugular. It is because ECOWAS realizes its true nature and true position mm -hmm. that accepts Diplomacy and conversation and discussion are used to resolve issues. Issues get complicated. Okay. Well, uh, as you know, um, the I don't want you to call them the offending states, so as not to uh, muddy the waters. We're talking all diplomaties now. Um, but um, those three states, Niger, Mali, and Burkina Faso, had actually accused ECOWAS of working for the quote unquote enemy. Uh, the way they saw it, and that it wasn't benefiting them. Indeed, uh, they, 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 they threatened, and I don't know if they actually have set up uh, another body. Now, uh, clearly, ECOWAS doesn't need that, uh, such fragmentation uh, within the body. Uh, but how will ECOWAS, because it did say it was leaving some aspects of the sanctions very much on the table. I don't know. Maybe you'll be able to enlighten us on that, what those are. We call them targeted sanctions. Yeah. Well, well, well when Omar Ture announced on Saturday, he made it clear that ECOWAS, the community, was lifting economic, financial, and what he called institutional sanctions. Definitely not political. Uh, and the political aspect will continue to be uh, in operation until further notice. That was his statement. However, if we look at ECOWAS itself, it is more of an economic community than a political community. If people are able to move freely across the community, they are able to trade with one another from one country to the other. 90% of the duties and functions of ECOWAS have been achieved. The political one is very shady. It's neither here nor there. We are talking about the political in terms of hostility, that when you organize election, you are not going to be involved. 
invited as members and all these things, they're not quite clear. So for me, ECOWAS has done the right thing, the most important thing, by lifting the economic and the social as well as institutional aspect of the sanctions. It is going to operate now as if there are no sanctions anymore. And Yuri, don't let us forget this. I alluded to this the last time we had a conversation on this, that the complications and contradictions would be too many for ECOWAS to bear if we are not where we are now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The sanctions will have had negative effects on the three countries in this course, but much more on ECOWAS as a body. I mean, there are things that we cannot do in isolation of these three countries. For instance, what happened to the multinational security tax force, of which these countries were members? What happened to the ACNA agreement that was you know, established in a bid to solve this security and economic problem? What happened to all of this? And they go, Ginja, no, one, no, no man is an island. No one is an island. I think ECOWAS has realized that it is going to be very difficult, if not impossible, for her as a body to operate successfully without having this in operation. Um, I hope somewhere that uh, these three countries we are talking about constitute just about 10 percent of ECOWAS. demography, representation. I mean, you cannot ignore Burkina Faso, Niger, and Mali in ECOWAS politics without ECOWAS itself, you know, uh, feeling it very, very hard. So the, the decision is welcome, it is expected, it is not unexpected, and it is the ideal thing for any sub organization to do in this world of history in Africa, and of course, that for the sake of. Yeah, but, but, but where, does, where, where does this leave um, uh, the uh, admirable de uh, declaration of ECOWAS that uh, as a body it had a zero tolerance for illegal uh, government regime changes, uh, you know, government changes, and uh, there was absolutely no question about that. Let it be clear. Remember, in the very early days, um, even though now that this has happened, uh, we also read that um, a grouping of the Senate of senators from across the 19 states of the country have actually hailed ECOWAS and indeed our president, who, who as you know, is pivotal in the affairs of ECOWAS. Um, but where does that leave those kind of um, ideal, uh, idealistic uh, proposals about no mm. anti-democratic changes of government will not be tolerated? Uh, does, 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 uh, uh. Is it sort of like eating its... Having to eat its words a bit. No, no, Yuri, I don't think ECOWAS is eating its words. Uh, the pronouncement, political ECOWAS will not tolerate illegal government or any form of unconstitutional government is expected of any responsible organization, a sub regional one at that. So making that statement was quite in order and is still quite in order. Now that sanctions are being lifted, I think ECOWAS is now rethinking the concept of democracy. Democracy is often defined as the government of the people, for the people, and the people. The people there does not necessarily get to used to periodic election as a means of having government. It has to do with the feelings of these people. It has to do with the sentiments of these people. It has to do with the yearnings and aspirations of these people. It also has to do with the way people, the people we are talking about, perceive issues and interpret issues. These are the issues that border on democracy. So, if a people understand this issue this way, even when it is wrong on the pages of textbook, 
the understandings, the interpretations of the people will dictate and determine what happens. And that is why when you see, uh, the, when you look at the statement of the president of ECOWAS, three reasons were given for the lifting of the sanctions. One is the approaching Ramadan, which is a religious issue that holds heavy sentiment in the minds of the people of this country. And of course, the approaching of um, um, Yen. And the third one is intervention of prominent actors in sub-regional politics, such as Alaji uh, Yakubu Gowan, you know, as it were. I'm sure Obasanjo too will have been considered in terms of his opinion when these decisions were taken. Yuri, these three factors are merely sentimental. They are not political. They are not legal. They are not even constitutional. And they are taken as the serious matters over which ECOWAS took its decision. So this tells you that ECOWAS is now thinking and rethinking democracy as values that people hold in esteem. And so if in Niger there is a coup, and the majority of people in Niger say that this is what we want. That yeah. is democracy. Yeah. Even when elections don't vote. And exactly. This is what you're supposed to be thinking about it. Here. So what ECOWAS is explaining, in my view, is a sudden realization that an institution like, an institution like that cannot reduce democracy or governance to just periodic election or military versus not military oppression. Mm -hmm. The realities of the people, the sentiments of the people, the aspirations of the people, the understanding and interpretations of the people must come first. Okay. And this, for me, is a welcome development. And it is part of what I've always been advocating, that ECOWAS must listen to the people who constitute the member states. You cannot just operate on that legal framework of if you are not democratic, Therefore, you go to hell and you burn to ashes. The complications are going to be much more on ECOWAS and, of course, the world than what we are now. Okay. Um, Akade, I do believe you made a, a slip there somewhere. Um, Yakubu Gowan is a, a known Christian. What well, you did say, Alaji Yakubu Gowan. I, 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 I realize that. I, I take that back. Yakubu <laughs> Gowan is not an Alaji, perhaps a pastor. Um, I take that back. Apologies <laughs> to the <folks. laughs> Indeed. Um, so, um, you know, uh, this and this, following from what you've just finished saying, um, this is what the spokespeople for the coupists have said, that um, they are disappointed uh, in terms of what they are getting uh, uh, as it concerns governance, that they simply are not getting governance at the pace that they would want. And you had made the point that, yeah, there is textbook, you know, uh, what, what, what you might call it, uh, to one side, but the people on ground are saying that they have, are beginning to feel that they are actually not getting the dividends of their resources. Uh, of, and, because, and, the people, because the people are the center of democracy. It is their feeling that should debate what happened, not textbook, not what you copy on pages of the, the law. Or the text. So, exactly. So, where does this leave um, the relations that the rest of ECOWAS has with some of the countries that they have taken on in their action and have faced frontally, uh, principally talking about um, like the French, like the Russians, for example, but in particular, uh, the French. As you know, they've excused the French from their territories, to put it uh, diplomatically like that. Um, where does this leave all that whole regional uh, politics and security? Well, um, nobody's a soothsayer, and so it may be difficult, if not impossible, to have a straight jacket prediction of what happens tomorrow. But theoretically speaking, we must always remember certain factors. Number one, that international relations in diplomacy are central to the interest of the state. Are involved in. Every state protects its political interests. 
And it is the political success of a member state that will determine the policies that are executed at the foreign level. When there is a call for or from rejection of diplomatic relations, as we have seen between Niger and France, Burkina and France, or there is any shake up, what is expected is alignment and alignment of forces. So what it means is that each of these countries, whether we are talking about the African countries in question, the three African countries, or other countries in Africa, or even the European countries that are involved in this approach. Each of them, we align, we align their forces with state and institutions that protect their own domestic interests. How that is going to play is unknown. But I can tell you, Ohio, that exactly is what is going to happen. We will see the next. Um, six months or one year as a very interesting period in the history of West Africa, Africa, and the world. And we will be discussing this. Indeed. Um, how, how complicated do you think the issue of um, uh, President Bazoum uh, still being uh, in, under house arrest in his country? And this was a categorical, a straightforward demand that they had made. They, all, they, they, they made it sound at the time as an almost... Um, irreducible uh, demand, but he remains still in, you know, in, in protective custody, albeit in his own, you know, domain, in his own palace or in his own house. This is when and where wishes become a public, a tenable public issue. Uh, it's difficult to know, but we can only wish the president the best. Whatever happens to him from the home. I suppose we, uh, how, how is he any diplomatist? Is he former president or are we in order to be referring to him still as uh, President well, Bazoum? It, it, depends, it depends on who is making the statement. You know, political statements are usually uh, value laden. Uh, if you call somebody cook waters, if you call somebody uh, terrorist, uh, it depends on who is who is referred to as always today, and uh, in the case of himself, as a freedom fighter. And so, we really don't have practical and legitimate uh, political situation. It really depends on the angle from which you are talking. So, we can call them, I mean, we can call him former president, we can call him president, <laughs> we can call him president, the mother of the monkey, and the pastor of the king. Okay. Now, whereas you said you weren't surprised at all that ECOWAS has uh, uh, moved the way it has done, um, what do you think this will now do to the um, uh, the regional body that they themselves had you're, said? You're in, you're in now, there's so much there's so much noise in your background. Discussions are heavy in your background. I I I'm struggling to pick your words now. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, we're, we're in studio here. Uh, uh, sorry about that. Um, we, we, we'll work on it, but um, in studio here, it is soundproofed. So um, I, we can't hear it, but the important thing is that you are hearing a disturbance. Yeah. And so getting louder. Getting louder. It's even getting louder as we speak. Yeah. yeah. Oh, dear. Okay, now. Yes, the conversation is still on, but you can't speak. I'm just struggling to hear you. That's just the problem. Yeah, I, as I said, I'm sorry. Um, but if it was something that I could say, please stop making noise, uh, indeed, that would be okay. But I was saying that we acknowledge the difficulty you have told us. We're in a soundproof studio uh, that is silent to us, but that it is noisy to you. Our technical guys are on it as we speak. Uh, so sorry uh, uh, about that. And I, was, I was going to ask, and I'll try and speak louder in case it will help. I was, going, I was asking what you think um, this will do to the regional... Uh, alignment that they had made uh, when it, they were still very much adamant about um, going their own way, that is, leaving, leaving ECOWAS. But now that they have been invited to reconsider, um, again, how do you see it? Yes, you've said that nobody is a soothsayer, but how do you see um, them reacting to this invitation? 
to reconsider yeah. their stance? Yeah. Again, what happens, I often say is that when you look at the military in Burkina, especially, and by extension, the military in Niger and Mali, you see, except you don't want to be objective, you see military institutions that appear very intellectual. And I'm putting that word in quote. It's not just that they have military intervention and then the soldiers come and take decision, bully everybody and go. No. If you have been following the conversation in these three countries, you see that periodically they sit down to discuss and analyze and interrogate issues across the globe, political issues, social issues, and they do so from well-informed perspectives. I mean, I'm very close to these three countries, and uh, by virtue of what I do, I interact a lot with their intellectuals. They engage before they take decisions. And when you have institutions like that, that do not just take decisions based on sentiment, that engage critically from informed position before taking decisions, you have an institution that is likely to be reasonable. Based on this premise, I can predict that now that ECOWAS has handed out the olive branch to these three countries, they will also reciprocate by coming for negotiation, discussions, and interaction. Knowing fully well, and I alluded to this in my earlier discourse, that if they were allowed to go away, the contradictions and complications that will come out of there will not affect ECOWAS alone. It will also affect them. So it's a two-way thing. Two people are struggling on a particular matter. Two people will now need to come back to the table and say, we realize that if we did what we wanted to do, we will have this and this as negative side. You will also have this and this as negative side. How do we come to the middle point so that the negative of your own side will be I mean, sent back and the negative from the other side will also be sent back? In other words, I foresee more... Uh, 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 diplomatic interactions and responses, and I think that's the word, mm. uh, diplomatic, good diplomatic response from Burkina Faso, Benin, I mean, um, um, Mali, and of course, Niger. But I can assure you, Yori, they are not going to be hasty in doing it. I've been following the politics. They will meet again, consult widely, both locally and internationally, before they come out to take decisions. That is the nature of okay. the military institution in these three countries. Okay. What is one to make of um, the reactions? I, I, can you hear me better now? Is it, is it any better? Yes, yes. Yeah. The noise okay. is gone. Now. Congratulations, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you for that. As, as I said, <laughs> our engineers were on, were on it. What, yeah. what can we really make now in, in hindsight and in view of some of the things that you have said uh, relating to um, the actual people in those countries being on ground and knowing uh, what their daily lives are. What can one make of the crowds that we saw? Uh, take Mali, for instance. There were drone shots upon, of crowds upon crowds, and it seemed as if this was a universally popular move in there. But I then, I then hear some intellectuals uh, you know, uh, in, in discussions uh, cautioning that one should you know, take those pictures with caution, that there's a total difference between uh, the people coming out and, uh, as you said, some of those things that they consider when they are engaging among themselves, uh, the, the leaders, as to the right way to go. That people, uh, in fact, somebody, so, some people have criticized say, people saying it was a popular coup just because we saw the crowds on the streets. Yeah, see, Yuri, uh, in political behavior, uh, there's something we call crowd analysis um, when a particular protest or a rally or a demonstration takes place you can do a critical analysis of the crowd to arrive at conclusion of whether the crowd is representative of the opinion of the majority 
or not. I have had the cause to visit Nigeria Republic during this scenario. I have conducted research activities in Burkina Faso during this scenario. In fact, as I speak, I'm engaging with a team of intellectuals from Burkina Faso on the political situation as we speak. Yori, don't let anyone deceive us. The crowd you saw in Burkina, in Niger, in Mali, especially Niger, that is the most recent, is representative of people's resolve against bad governance. The crowd is representative of people's resolve against externalization of the state. Seeing international intervention as international conspiracy, the state is against that. It doesn't mean that that crowd is pro-military or anti-democratic. That's where many people get it wrong. Okay. The crowd that we saw in Niger came out to make statement that irrespective of the name you call the system of government that you are practicing, if there is no food on the table of the common man, that system is not popular. If there is no security of lives and property, that event is not popular. And that's exactly what it is. So I can tell you, Oha, that the crowd you see in, uh, in Niger is a representative of the frustration of the people about the dominant political situation. And they didn't miss what in coming out to express it. It okay. doesn't mean it is prominent, neither does it mean it is anti-democratic. It was responding to the current situation of the place, mm -hmm. and people needed change, and they expressed it. Indeed. Well, so we'll take a quick break now. We'll be right back. Please stay with us, uh, Dr. Okawadi Esuola, and uh, uh, our viewers. We'll be right back.